Hey everyone, JM here at Disciple Dojo. And before we jump into this next study Bible review, go ahead and do me a favor. If you haven't already, click the subscribe button. It's right down there on your screen. And if you like this video when we're done, click like and consider sharing it with other people. We want this channel to continue to grow. And the best way to do that is with subscribers, liking and sharing our content. So it would mean a lot if you would do that. All right, let's look at a study Bible. Today, we are looking at the Ancient Modern Bible. This is by Thomas Nelson, and it comes in this cool slipcase, which we're going to get rid of. This copy that I have is a hardback, as you can see, and it is 1,676 pages. In the back, it has 16 full-color pages that I'll tell you about in just a minute, and then eight color maps after that. This one comes with not one, but two ribbons, so you can keep track of Old Testament and New Testament readings. For preachers and teachers, the more ribbons, the better. And it's a black letter edition. So the words of Christ, not in red. The pages are multicolored with a little bit of burgundy and some gold. Not a lot of color, but each page is, I guess, technically full color. The format is single columned, not double column. And there's ample space in the margins on each page. This was done intentionally, it says at the beginning, in the opening introduction to this Bible, so that readers could take notes in the margins. The book introductions are each two pages, and at the top it gives you the author, the audience, the date, the purpose, and the themes. And then it has two pages on not just what the book is about, but how it's been interpreted by famous interpreters throughout church history. There are also dozens of one-page biographies of famous individuals throughout the history of the church going all the way back from ancient times to today. And each one is in this kind of a light blue color. It's a one page. It has their name. It has a brief one titled description. And then it has the date that they lived, followed by an overview of their life and their ministry, and then some important works that they've done as well. And that's what this Bible is all about. This is the ancient modern Bible. The focus is to connect readers today with the whole history of Christendom. Now, there are no study notes per se, in this Bible. Instead, you have these sections in the margins where there is an excerpt from a church father, a historical theologian, a modern theologian or interpreter, a biblical scholar that's been included beside the passages that are relevant to that quote. And these notes are from a wide range, both historically in time and also ecumenically in terms of tradition. For instance, on Mark 15, there's an excerpt from Matthew Henry, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Pope John Paul II. So this is a very ecumenical Bible. You're getting notes not just from one stream of church history, but you're getting notes from everybody. There are biographies in here of people like Athanasius, St. John of the Cross, Jacob Arminius, John Wesley, John Calvin, Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine, John Chrysostom, Justin Martyr, and even modern interpreters like N.T. Wright or John Stott. I mean, this really does an impressive job of pulling from a wide range of theological traditions and interpreters, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, ancient, modern. So it has truly earned its name as the ancient modern Bible. Now at the end of the Bible, there are supplemental articles. There are articles on creation and the fall, an article by Tim Keller on meditating on God's word, an article by Gerald Bray on the church, an article on salvation and union with Christ, an article on the Trinity, an excerpt from N.T. Wright's book, Surprised by Hope, called What the World is Waiting For. And then this is really cool. After that, there are a number of creeds from the early church. So you have the Apostles' Creed, you have the Nicene Creed, you have the Chalcedonian definition of faith, the Athanasian Creed. And then after that, you have a number of sources, both ancient and modern, everyone from Thomas Akempis to Ulrich Zwingli. And then after that, you have readings for Advent, Lent, and Easter. And that's the end of the material. There are no concordance, there's no dictionary, but then you come to this section. These are all full color pages on thicker paper called The Art of the Church. And each one shows 
artwork spanning the millennia that's imported in the history of Christianity or the history of art. Now, my undergraduate degree is in art. I've had to take my fair share of art history classes. I really appreciated this. I thought this is a cool thing to include in a Bible, seeing the different expressions of faith. And it's not all Western. It starts with early Greco-Roman Eastern Orthodox art. Then it does get into the medieval period and then in the Western Renaissance traditions. But then it ends with some modern art, including this final piece by a Japanese Christian, Makoto Fujimura, that was done in 1997. So it's a wide range of art, of theology, of the creeds, and then at the end you come to the section with the maps. Now, like I said, there aren't any study notes, so you're not going to really detect a theological position that this takes other than excerpts or quotes from famous interpreters throughout history that may have to do with a particular verse. But those are so varied, so there's not really a detectable theological bias. What this is, is you're getting almost like a survey of church historical theological interpretation. Let me give you what I think are the pros and the cons of this particular Bible. The pros are it has a gorgeous layout. The color on the pages, it's subtle, but it's nice between the gold and the scarlet and then the black ink. It's single columned, which you know if you've watched any of these reviews, I'm a huge fan of single column and it leaves tons of room for taking notes. I love the layout of this Bible. Even the way it's put together, it's compact, but yet it's it's substantial. The two ribbons is a nice touch. Just having a couple of bookmarks handy is always nice. Even having a slip case is nice so you can sit it on the shelf and then you can pull it off the shelf and use it, but this will keep the rest of your books in place. I mean, that's super book nerdy, but I'm telling you all the things I like about it and that is one of them. I also think the range of theological views is an incredible strength. Good study Bibles should give you a variety of perspectives and this does a good job of presenting the church in in all its fullness throughout time. I love having the creeds right there. Usually the creeds are something that people think about, but unless you're used to reciting the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, it just kind of gets lost in the dustbin of history. And you're like, yeah, there's creeds. I know they're important, but I don't know what they say. So being able to turn right in the back of your Bible and have access to the creeds, the earliest teachings that bound the church together in its broadest sense. I love that. I, I think more study Bibles should include some of the creeds. That's super super helpful in rooting the faith in the history of God's people. And a lot of times us Protestants, we're not really good at remembering this stuff. I mean, there's some Christians you'd think church history didn't start until the Reformation or Charles Spurgeon or the Wesleyan Revival. So I like that this ancient modern Bible roots us in our universal Catholic lowercase c tradition of the church. They also do a good job with the biographies in here. They're not overly long, but they do give you a good snapshot of who this person was and what makes them important in church history. And the little one-line description of each person that they do a biography of is good at cementing in your mind not only the name of this person and when they were around, but why they're important, why they mattered. So William Tyndall is the champion of the English Bible. And then it goes on to tell you about William Tyndall, why he matters. Or this one on John Stott, advocate of global evangelicalism. And if you know John Stott, which you should know John Stott, he's literally one of my spiritual heroes. He was the greatest advocate of global evangelicalism in the 20th century. And then it also tells you the works that they did that you should follow up with. So in this case, for Stott, it lists basic Christianity and the Lausanne Covenant. Those are some pretty important works in the history of the church. And so this does a good job of rooting us in the faith bigger than just our particular traditions. And so I think that's the greatest strength of this Bible theologically. In addition to, you know, it's put together nice, it's a beautiful layout, great binding, all of that, it does a major service to the church, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, Coptic, all the branches of the Christian tree. So big kudos in that department. Now, let me be honest, let's get to some cons. There are some things I do not like about this Bible and ways that it could be improved. So Thomas Nelson, you paying attention? Because I'm super important. I mean, I've got like a thousand subscribers, so I got a lot of clout, obviously. But seriously, there are some things, if you are listening, Thomas Nelson, that you could improve about this Bible. Some you probably don't want to hear. Some I think you'll want to hear is constructive criticism. Number one, this is in the New King James Version. I hold to the view of Doug Stewart and Gordon Fee in How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth that the NKJV is actually the least helpful translation. It doesn't have the beauty 
and the majesty of the King James English that so many people love, but it is based on the manuscript families that the King James translators used, which were the best they had at the time, but have since been shown to be inaccurate at times. Now, if talk about translation is new to you and you don't know what I even mean by manuscript families, go ahead and click on this video right here, and you're going to see an excerpt from our course here at Disciple Dojo, Bible for the Rest of Us, where we talk about translation theory and manuscripts and why it matters. So while there are a lot of pros, that's my biggest con is that this is the New King James Version, which I do not recommend. Now, it's not like the New King James Version is evil or corrupt or awful or anything like that. It's just of all the translations, it's one of the ones I would recommend the least. The other con, and this is one that Thomas Nelson could easily fix, all those cool biographies of these dozens of important people in church history, there's no index that I could find, unless this is a defective copy, there's no index or listing of them anywhere in this Bible. So you literally have to go searching to find them and hope that you come across one. I'm amazed that that got through the editorial process. Like I said, unless this is a defective copy, and I did get it at a used bookstore, so it could be, but I could not find any list of those biographies that are really good, really helpful biographies. And it would be incredibly helpful to have an index of them so I can go, I want to know about Athanasius. And I could go, oh, it's right on page whatever. But right now, they're just haphazardly placed unmarked throughout the text. And that is just unbelievably poor decision on the part of the publisher. One other, I hesitate to call it a weakness because it's not the purpose of the Bible. I get it. The purpose was to give excerpts of famous interpreters throughout history, but the lack of any study notes makes this uh, not as great as it could be. There are some passages that it would be helpful to have more than just one person's quote. So when you're reading through Romans, it would be nice to have more than just Martin Luther or Augustine or the various interpreters that they've chosen on a specific passage. Instead, on every passage, at most, you only get one historical perspective. Now, the perspectives do vary. We've talked about that. They do a great job of that, but you're still only getting at most one per passage, and sometimes that's less than helpful. My last critique, and this is small compared to the other ones, but the paper is that thin onion skin, kind of chalky feeling paper. And the only reason I mentioned that is because this Bible specifically says they have these nice wide margins for taking notes, and that's what it's for, but the paper does not lend itself to good notes. Note taking. So unless you're using, I don't know, a pencil or a super fine point pen, you're going to get like blurring or crumpling or just the paper is not great. It's just so flimsy and ASMR people. Here you go. So they could have done a thicker paper. Now it would have made the Bible a little bit more substantial, but for something like this, I don't think that's too much of a trade-off, especially how small it is overall anyway. So do I recommend the ancient modern Bible? Yes, I do recommend it. I really like it, but I do not recommend it as a primary study Bible. I think it's perfect for doing what it is built to do, which is to sit on the shelf and then you pull it out when you need it. I think it's great if this were a Bible you used for devotional reading, for contemplative reading, for after you've studied a passage in your regular study Bible and you want to see what a particular person from church history may have said about the passage you're reading or how the book you're looking at has been interpreted throughout the ages. I think it would be a good Bible to take to church as you're following along in the sermon, jotting down sermon notes, but also having access to the creeds and keeping you tied into the universality of the Christian faith. So that's what I would recommend this for. Not primary study Bible, but yes, even in the New King James, it is worth having and worth using. I do. I really do. I like this Bible a lot. I love the idea. I think the execution could have been better if they would do a couple of those tips that I just said, especially you got to put an index. You're killing me, Smalls. It's so hard to find any article on the people that are chronicled in this that are worth reading about. So take a look at it sometime. Let me know what you think. If you've used this Bible, share your thoughts in the comment section below. Those are mine. What are yours? All right, guys, thanks for watching. And again, if you like this video, be sure to click like, share it with some other Bible nerds out there and check out our other videos here, our other study Bible reviews, our superhero seminary videos, or just our Disciple Dojo teaching videos. Our channel library is growing every day and we intend for these resources to be evergreen so you can use them and share them and study from them and learn from them in perpetuity until our modern becomes ancient. That's it. We'll see you next time.